so much, uh, Mr. Joseph, uh, for that introduction. And I would uh, thank, first of all, Madras uh, Tax uh, Bar Association for inviting me and providing this opportunity. Uh, speaking to all learned people like you uh, is also an honor for me. So uh, it's a great honor and privilege uh, to talk about this. Yes, Joseph, sir, I'll start right away from this decision which came out yesterday. And I think uh, before I go on to the merits of the case and the ground and so on and so forth, I think the entire judicial system today is to be praised because the way the judges, the way the court clerks, the way all of us professionals are working in such a way so that justice uh, is not denied and the justice continues, I think this case in itself means a lot because Delhi High Court got onto the virtual hearing and pronounced this decision in a time when everybody is looking for some benefits in some way or the other. So from that perspective, I think uh, it was a virtual hearing uh, which happened and which basically gave a lot of to the taxpayers in the sense that this, with, this was with respect to the tra transitional credits. The moot point before the court was whether the time limit prescribed in the rules by the delegated legislation, that period of 90 days, which has been prescribed in Rule 117, is there a vested right with respect to the transitional credits? So with that moot point, uh, all of this, uh, uh, these lot of these uh, matters went to the court. And these are uh, those issues where the delay happened, not because of the technical reasons, but because of the reasons other than the technical reasons, which means that there was no system glitch. There were not those identified cases where there was a system glitch. There were, these were those cases where people actually forgot to take the credit within the stipulated time of 90 days. And then the moot point before the court was whether it's a vested right, whether Article 300 capital A of the Indian Constitution will come into play to say whether this is the right to property, whether subordinate legislation could predominantly fix time for uh, such uh, things such as getting these transitional credit back into the system. Uh, also, one of the points which is actually not there uh, in the case law, but which was very much argued was that most of the time limits which are prescribed are prescribed in the Act. And this is an exception to that. But I think uh, the bench was pretty much convinced about that. And very, very relevant point was the arbitrariness of fixation of this uh, point uh, uh, for filing of this return, which is 90 days. And the moot point before the court, which was raised was that why only 90 days? Why not nine weeks? Why not nine years? Why not nine months? And how the authorities have derived this period of 90 days? And I think that's what was matter was the court understood that yes, this period prescribed of 90 days will have to be looked logically uh, from the arbitrary perspective, from other perspectives, and what should be the reasonable point, and if that reasonable point is beyond 90 days, what it should be. So, from that perspective, uh, it, is, it is what is now, what has now happened for the first time is that the period of three years has been provided and that three year period, the reliance has been made onto the limitation act. So I think that is very encouraging that the GST uh, cases are now being determined in light of such all other provisions and other acts. So I think that's one of the very, very important aspect. The other aspect which was very, very important was with respect to the technical difficulty. And if somebody would have got the chance to read the order, what is technical difficulty? Is there a technical difficulty only when there's a technical glitch and only when, the, when there is an error on the part of the government? Can there also be a technical difficulty and whether that can be extended even when in such a transitional reformative uh, phase, even the taxpayers are facing that challenge of understanding the law, implementing the law, having their systems. And hence, one line which was very, very motivating to read in the order was that it says very clearly that it is not only, it, 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 it cannot be expected from the taxpayers to be ready on day one. And hence, I think the court acknowledged that. And um, 
very very clearly held that there cannot be two different yardsticks when it comes to the technical difficulty so i think from that perspective the court clearly held uh, one that this time limit prescribed is directory and not mandatory that is one secondly the period uh, of uh, the limitation act which is 3 years will come into play third and the most important aspect is that it is very rare that it is mentioned in the order that the benefit will not be for the petitioner or the petitioners the benefit extends to all of the such tax payers who would have faced this problem of missing this credit and i think that is personally very very motivating it just happened yesterday that that line was not there mentioned specifically in the order but in the virtual hearing it was agreed after the argument that that should be added clear instructions were given to the respondents that they should publicize this order make this available to all of the taxpayers so that each of the taxpayers who are facing very very tough situation right now the economic turn down they will be able to get the benefit so that is very important uh, you know for us to know and understand that in light of this uh, the benefit gets extended to so many different people so uh, it gets extended to so many different people and what will happen is now all of the petitioners who are even out of the jurisdiction of delhi high court can get the benefit so there could be three set of petitioners one that petitioner who would have got negative order from let's say bombay high court second those petitioners who were not in the court but are in the bombay jurisdiction and third those petitioners who are outside the court of maharashtra because as we speak there is a negative order in the state of maharashtra so i would like to say that because the respondent is union of india what will happen in this case is that all of these tax payers outside the jurisdiction of maharashtra will certainly have the benefit those that petitioner who have a negative order will have to rely on this order and file an slp to go to the supreme court third those petitioners who are still within the state of maharashtra can get the benefit of this order till the stay is not received one of the respondent is also union of india and it has been casted as a responsibility on even the union of india as a respondent to publicize this order so that the benefit goes on to each and every one so i think from that perspective thousands and thousands of the taxpayers who missed those deadlines so uh, we have seen in the past also moving on to the other cases where i argued with respect to the uh, transitional credit where uh, there are contradictory decisions and that is with respect to the one year uh, time frame which is required with respect to the inputs procured and being part of the gst chain so we know that abhishek there sir, is uh, a jcb I'm sorry order to interrupt. Uh, from abhishek sir i'm sorry to high court there is i have hello ah uh, uh, i think yes, sir thank you thank you sorry for interrupting yeah i'll try to be a little louder no problem maine mail kar raha hu na kuch dekho na whatsapp mein but will it work just a bit sundar will it work ah uh, i uh, um... i request all the all the participants in uh, to turn off your videos also uh, because there are uh, a, a high number of participants so if all of you turn on your video then there might be some issues with the bandwidth also so uh, i request if the participants should turn off your video But during the question on the session you can turn on your videos and ask your question so thank you again yes sir abhishek sir you can start hello sir we can hear you now sir abhishek sir
Sir, uh, you are audible, sir. You are audible now. Yeah, I am audible now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am wearing the uh, headphones now, so I think it should okay. be much better. It is very clear now, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, so moving ahead. Uh, uh, sorry about that. So moving ahead with respect to the transitional credit, we have seen that there are contradictory decisions with respect to the one-year time frame when uh, there was a negative decision from the Bombay High Court and the contradictory positive decision from the Gujarat High Court. Fortunately, when I was arguing in the Delhi High Court, we thought that what is most relevant as of now was to get the interim relief by way of getting those credits. And hence, there are various petitions which are there in Delhi High Court with respect to those transitional credits, which will of course now be decided by the Supreme Court, all of these decisions together. And there would be some transfer of these petitions from even the Delhi High Court. So I think all of these uh, decisions with respect to the transitional credits and with respect to different issues, whether these credits remain a vested right, whether Article 300A, capital A of the Indian Constitution would come into play, will become very, very essential now. Uh, this decision will set the tone uh, even for the Supreme Court to decide on these transitional credit issues. I think Supreme Court cannot ignore uh, this decision of the Delhi High Court, this recent decision, because this decision covers all aspects, all different juris uh, all different decisions of different high courts, and has basically laid down the foundation with respect to these transitional credits. Uh, moving ahead from the transitional credits, uh, I would want to start with the first case which was there uh, filed for. Uh, uh, within the GST for the legal services. And just a one liner about that uh, is that with respect to the legal services, when there was a forward charge uh, implemented with respect to the legal services for LLPs, there was a writ petition which was argued by us in Delhi High Court. And I think uh, the GST council within, uh, within a day or so amended that law. So why I wanted to highlight this particular case and various other cases is that I think in this dynamic tax changing environment, even the GST Council, uh, the government of India, the tax authorities will have to be given due credit because a lot of these petitions which were filed uh, at some stage or the other, they have become infructuous by way of subsequent amendments, subsequent notifications or the GST Council addressing the ambiguity. So I would uh, uh, address some of those writs as well. But the moot point still remains that what happens to the benefit uh, which could either flow uh, for the period till the time this new amendment notification etc has come or is there a way out which could still be suggested to different clients uh, in this situation so that there could be some cash uh, saving. So uh, one of the very very important um, writ petition which was filed all across uh, courts within India was with respect to the ocean freight without spending much time on the on the grounds with respect to the ocean freight the moot point remained uh, in the ocean freight uh, dispute that what happens when in a gst regime the service provider and the service recipient are defined can it is it possible that the tax is to be paid by the importer on the cif value when he is not the recipient of the service as per the definitions within the GST regime. Uh, so there were writ petitions which were filed in Bombay High Court, uh, which for which the rule has been issued. There, there were writ petitions, bunch of petitions, uh, which even I had argued in Gujarat, wherein we know for a fact that this levy has, this uh, tax on ocean freight has been held to be unconstitutional. Uh, there are several writ petitions, even in Delhi High Court, which have not been decided. Uh, as we speak, SLP has not being filed there is no stay and hence again the question which arises is that till the time there is no stay can the assessee stop to pay such tax on uh, with respect to the ocean freight so that's the other element which i think we should think that you know how we could uh, assist our clients or suggest our clients with respect to this pendency at the supreme court Another very interesting aspect which uh, came uh, before various courts, uh, which I argued in uh, Rajasthan High Court, Uttar Pradesh, Allahabad High Court, and uh, Bombay, 
was with respect to the entertainment tax. There were a lot of benefits with respect to the entertainment tax, which were given to specific players, such as the multiplex owners, the entertainment uh, amusement parks. And these were those specific benefits which were given with respect to either duty retention or exemptions with respect to the entertainment tax. And this was based completely on uh, the investment made by the uh, petitioners or the, uh, or the taxpayers. The point which now arises is after the transition into the GST regime, will these benefits promised by the state continue? The other point which also remains is that what will happen with respect to the concept of the principle of promissory estoppel. We have seen that recently uh, in the case of VVF Limited, the Supreme Court has a week back passed a decision wherein this concept of principle of promissory estoppel was argued at length. With that negative decision in the Supreme Court, the moot point which remains is that a lot of these uh, petitions which are pending in different high courts, either for entertainment tax in Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Allahabad High Court, and a lot of the budgetary support notifications which were there uh, with respect to the benefits in JNK, benefits in Uttarakhand, whether this concept of principle of promissory estoppel in light of this recent Supreme Court decision will come into play to deny the benefit to large number of these writ petitions which are there. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion and debate on this uh, case as well. And uh, the beauty is that the principle of subsilentia will come into play and it will appropriately come into play in such a way uh, that this benefit will continue and it is hoped that the courts will give a patient hearing to understand that all of these benefits which were promised and which have now been curtailed in some way or the other are with respect to the transitional GST phase. And there is section 174 uh, in the CGST Act which will have to be uh, argued at length to see that what is the right accrued, what is the privilege, etc., and so on and so forth. So from that perspective, even if there is, there is a Supreme Court decision in case of VVF, which will make life a little tough for my uh, lawyer friends, but I'm sure that the principle of sub silencio will be a weapon which should be used and will be used to defend, to defend dozens of these petitions which are there in different courts. Very interestingly, now I would want to move uh, to the benefit now talking about the principle of promissory estoppel. Uh, I would want to highlight one of the very few, uh, uh, very, uh, these initial writs which were filed with respect to the advance authorization. And what had happened in those cases? What had happened in those cases is that any importer who would have had the advance authorization was supposed to import goods without payment of duty in the erstwhile regime. Then came the GST regime and the moot point became that whether this IGST exemption should be extended or can be extended to these petitioners who already have an, an expired advance authorization. The transition happened into the GST and it was overlooked that these advance authorizations were there, valid licenses were there and hence for various uh, petitioners in Delhi High Court, I had argued this matter that this benefit should continue. The interesting part which was there with respect to these petitions is at no stage of the arguments, the principle of promissory estoppel came into play. What came into play was only the fact that there is a big hardship in terms of the working capital. And that became the moot point of discussion. The point of discussion which came was that the entire benefit with respect to the advance authorization was given with respect to those exporters who face a big crisis of working capital. Now, if that happens and that continues, what will happen to the make in India policy? So it was very, very interesting that this benefit was given by way of an interim order, which was there after finalized by Delhi High Court, the SLP was filed by the revenue, which was also ultimately dismissed. After the interim order, 
of the Delhi High Court, there was actually an amendment which happened in October 2017, by which this benefit of import and duty uh, import of goods without payment of IGST was extended uh, to uh, a larger group. And what happened when this got extended was that there was a condition which was imposed and that condition was nothing but a pre-import condition. Now, what happened because of that condition? There were a couple of different baskets which were there with respect to all of those cases wherein there was an interim order from the Delhi High Court till the time this amendment came in October of 2017, that intervening period was there because dozens of uh, petitioners got the benefit of the relief given by the Delhi High Court. That was one. So what happens to the intervening period? The second question was, with respect to this specified date in October 2017, the condition of pre-import came into play. Now, what happens when this condition of pre-import comes into play and what was this condition in actual means? Thereafter, once these, this was realized that this condition uh, is made ap applicable to all of these imports, the DRI started investigation all throughout the country. And when DRI started this investigation all throughout the country, there were hundreds and hundreds of notices issued, inquiries started. And the moot point, which was that, what is this pre-import condition? And I asked this question to myself as well, that this DRI, which is writing these letters, which are denying these benefit, what actually is this condition? And sometimes when these writ petitions are argued in different high courts, I think more than, than the law, it is the logic which is to be used. And I asked this question in the court itself that this pre-import condition has not been defined appropriately anywhere in the, in the policy or anywhere else. Now, if that has not been defined anywhere appropriately, the doctrine of void for vagueness comes in. What is the, that doctrine of void for vagueness is that if something is vague, is not defined, and is arbitrary, then that should become void. There could be different ways by which this pre-import condition could be understood and be implemented. And that is causing a big, big hassle uh, to the Indian uh, exporters. Gujarat High Court uh, was, had passed a favorable decision to held that this condition of pre-import is ultra wise the foreign trade policy. And that set the tone very, very clearly with the first baton, which was uh, started with respect to the advance authorization. The benefit, uh, uh, the battle continued to the second leg when this pre import condition was imposed. And now, with respect to the pre import condition, while there is a speaking order, a detailed order, an order which is worth to read from, uh, uh, from uh, Gujarat High Court. The SLP is pending before the Supreme Court, and I'm sure that Supreme Court will address all of these issues for the Indian exporters, keeping in mind the working capital issues, keeping in mind the larger public interest, keeping in mind that what was the intention to give these uh, foreign trade benefits, keeping in mind that India has recently lost to the US uh, in all of these international trade cases, and a lot of these benefits would not and could not flow over the period of time to the Indian exporters and what was the rationale behind this. So I think based on that, uh, this will again set the tone that how and in what way would these benefits continue uh, to the Indian exporters. And I think the decision with while the first battle was won, the SLP in the Supreme Court was decided favorably. The second battle which has crossed the high court stage will have to be ultimately be decided by the apex court to help that what is the implication of this pre-import condition. Moving on uh, to the next case, which is again very interesting, uh, for which the hearing has been concluded uh, in the Gujarat High Court. And I'm sure each of my lawyer friend, my clients, and my other uh, friends would appreciate this decision if this comes out. And this is with respect to the intermediary services. Now, why this decision will be very, very landmark and will change the
the entire course of the taxation system in the country is that one of the provisions with respect to the place of provision which is with respect to section 138b for intermediary services will come into play the question which is there before the court is that fixation of this point of uh, place of provision of this service for this intermediary wherein the service recipient is outside of india uh, whether the service whether the location of the service provider is an appropriate way or a mechanism to determine that this place of provision is in india with respect to these transactions there are various grounds which have been taken to justify that this this is actually arbitrary this is actually unconstitutional there have been representations already which have been made uh, the entire argument before the gujarat high court were basically divided into two set of um, uh, submissions one was whether the gujarat high court should give a recommendation uh, whether should pass an order that a recommendation be given by the high level committee by formation of such high level committee and then ultimately a decision be taken on determination of the place of provision of the service which was actually an easier way to look at the bigger problem the bigger issue which still remained and was argued for days before the gujarat high court was with respect to the constitutionality now this decision has has will have very very wide implications because what is being challenged is the provision of the igst act in light of the constitutional provisions uh it was very very clearly highlighted to the court that the core principle of gst is the destination based system the place of provision whether for the service provider the service recipient when they are in the country or for that matter when one of them is outside of india is completely based on the destination based concept and in all of these cases when the privity of the contract is between the indian service provider and the foreign customer who situated out of india who gets the benefit of these services who ultimately bears the benefit of this it should not the place of supply should not be dependent on the movement of the goods which ultimately happens from the transaction which is being facilitated by the indian intermediary if this decision comes uh, favorable then i am sure there are lot of indian intermediaries which will get the benefit it was also highlighted to the court that lot of these intermediaries are small players are moving out of the country and hence in the larger public interest it will be essential not only to look into the recommendation part of it but also look very closely on the constitutional part of it if this decision which has been argued if this uh, matter which has been argued by me comes in uh, at at a time when it is uh, when the entire industry when these players are facing lot of this economic crisis i think it will be a big big blessing moving uh, ahead one very another very interesting uh, issue wherein i have argued about dozen of writ petitions is with respect to anti profiteering anti profiteering has been a subject matter of dispute for real estate players for fmcg players for uh, these uh, food and beverages player so the moot point which still remains is whether you want to challenge section 171 or you want to go completely into an arithmetic mode and determine the quantum of profiteering there was a lot of thought initially and i still remember the first writ petition for anti profiteering in the case of pyramid infrastructure wherein there was a thought which was coming into my mind whether we should you know only work on the number basis and justify to the court that there is no profiteering or whether we should go ahead and challenge uh, the provisions of section 171 ultimately it was felt appropriate that it will be better to challenge the provisions of section 171 also because the two factors which are there in section 171 are one that there should be reduction in the quantum of the output tax second if there is an increase in the pool of the input tax credit then in either of these cases the benefit of this price reduction by way of commensurate reduction of prices should go on to the ultimate recipient of the supply the moot point which thereafter came 
before the court was whether these two points or whether these two factors of course these are relevant factors but are these the only factors the other point which again came before the court was with respect to the lack of methodology uh, initially in the initial petitions couple of hearings went uh, just to analyze whether there are appeal provisions whether all of these anti profiteering matters would come directly to the jurisdictional high court because these there is no mechanism by which it can go to any uh, other forum there were also uh, discussions with respect to the jurisdiction whether it should go to the delhi high court or whether it can go to any other high court because in few cases where the builders were from the neighboring state uh, uh, haryana based in gurgaon whether it would be possible for them to file these petitions in delhi high court or whether they would they should go to the uh, jurisdictional high court which is punjab and haryana high court at chandigarh so lot of these issues got settled and thereafter most of these sectors are facing that challenge of whether this methodology is sufficient while there are these two factors which are there these are relevant factors but are these the only factors to uh, determine what is commensurate reduction of prices whether commensurate reduction of prices has been defined what is commensurate is it actual and if it is not actual why the word commensurate has been used and again the doctrine of void for vagueness uh, will come into play to say that the act uses the word commensurate reduction of prices the act does not say actual reduction based on two factors now if that is the situation then will other factors will also come into play and especially in absence of a methodology to determine the quantum of profiteering it will be interesting to see how the courts finally decide the matters are currently before delhi high court some of the matters which were there in bombay high court have now been transferred to delhi high court uh, it will be interesting that how different sectors are uh, getting addressed and what view is being taken but as far as the penalty proceedings are concerned as far as the interest proceedings are concerned there are cases where full stay has been given in fact interestingly courts have held in most of the cases that the amount which has been determined Uh, as a stay would be kept in a fixed deposit only when the amounts are finally determined to be considered as profiteering or not will be released and the party who would win that will get the benefit of the fixed deposit interest rate also on that so anti profiteering has been a uh, very very interesting has kept all uh, of us uh, advocates lawyers and chartered accountants busy uh, there are proceedings and i hope that there will be some mechanism methodology way out by which there is more certainty uh, for the tax payers um, for the tax payers another very very interesting uh, aspect and which was very traumatic for lot of uh, indian businesses msmes was with respect to the arrest uh, provisions uh, arrest provisions have been used under the gst regime very rampantly with respect to the circular trading and before we go on to that we should understand that what is circular trading a sales goods to b b sales it to d uh, b sales it to c c sales it to d and d sales it back to a this is circular trading which has been done by lot of people in india with respect to increasing the turnover uh, and their business to obtain bank loans and so on and so forth the moot point which now arises is that if there is a duty evasion of more than 5 crores then it becomes uh, a non billable culpable uh, offense now what happens in that case is that the power is there with respect to these offenses and there can be a straight arrest the point which arises is that when all of these transactions happen by way of circular trading the first point is that whether there is any case of tax leakage if a pays the tax on the supply b pays tax on the supply c pays tax on the supply and at last d also pays tax on the supply the question which remains is that is there a case of tax evasion the other question is that the credit on the input side is held to be inadmissible in various cases but if there is no tax on the output side whether 
the question with respect to the admissibility of the credit uh, uh, will also become the part of the argument. I am not concluding whether these transactions which are being done is right or wrong, but what Abhishek, sir, your audio just got stuck, sir. Uh, okay. Can you so, so uh, what what was relevant is that with respect to these transactions, is there a tax leakage? That is one. Can arrest be made for all of these offenses? And if the arrest is made, what is the purpose of that arrest? Are these arrests being followed by proper procedure thereafter? Uh, whether uh, the arrest is helping the tax authorities and especially in those cases where evidence uh, is collected, lost, not lost and so on and so forth. So what is the purpose of this arrest? That is one. The second very, very essential element was with respect to challenge even the provisions of 132. And that's what I did. I have in some of the provisions even challenged that provision because while there could be a lot of discussion with respect to what will happen to the ineligibility of credit on the input side, a no, lot of petitions did not challenge the provisions of 132. And it becomes very, very relevant for us to challenge 132 also if the benefit has to be given to those transactions where there is no tax leakage. That is one. Secondly, coming back to the uh, various divergent views taken by different high courts, when the matter went to the Supreme Court, it was very important to highlight to the court that most of these jurisdictional high courts have decided on the issue. These are fact-based issue. And that's why uh, the landmark decision which was passed by the Apex Court was with respect uh, to these arrest provisions was that there is no point for the courts right now to intervene. Uh, the jurisdictional high courts have taken the view and that should continue. Uh, it helped the assessees in some way was uh, not helpful to various assessees in different ways where there were negative orders. But ultimately, the, high, uh, the, uh, the Apex Court concluded that there would be the formation of a three-member uh, bench uh, to decide, three-judge uh, bench to decide this issue so that this is now put to rest. So we will see that how uh, this goes further. There have been certain changes which have come into uh, play with respect to uh, these arrest provisions in this last finance uh, bill. So we will see that how that is being addressed. Now that I have some 18 minutes left for my presentation, maybe I will exceed, I will use 20, 22 minutes to cover these issues which are very relevant, but I will go a little faster to cover these issues. Uh, one of the very, very important writ petition which has been filed is with respect to challenging the uh, provisions with respect to rule 9610, which basically restricts uh, the benefit of rebate in various cases. Now, in a lot of these matters wherein the rebate benefit has been denied, there is no logic that why rebate benefit should not be, uh, should not be made available in cases, for instance, where there is a case of deemed exports, in cases where there is an instance of advanced authorization procurement, and so on and so forth. So, that will again, uh, this matter has again uh, been argued by me uh, in Gujarat High Court. The order has been uh, reserved, but there are, my matter was heard, but uh, there are other petitions also which uh, were clubbed thereafter, after completion of my matter. So it is, uh, it appears that the court will pass uh, the order together for all of the petitions in some time. Another interesting aspect with respect uh, to these writ petitions is for denial of credits, section 17.5, CD, etc., there are denial of credit and it becomes a great issue not only for the real estate players but even for the other players who are uh, getting these uh, credits. 
lot of these credits get denied because of these specific provisions and these have been challenged uh, in plethora of courts uh, so that this benefit is appropriately given there should not be any denial of credit under the gst regime because that's what one of the objective of the gst was i would not go into the details of the budgetary support uh, writ petition which have been filed in different courts uh, because that because uh, that has already been uh, covered uh, with respect to the transitional credit on capital goods there have been uh, uh, a petition in uttarakhand high court which again i will just skip for the time being uh, due to paucity of time uh, the other aspect which i want to take uh, is with respect to the real estate transactions real estate sector has not only been facing lot of trauma from anti profiteering perspective but also with respect to the development right the question which came before uh, the bombay high court for the development right was with respect to challenging that notification which imposed the point of taxation for the transfer of the development right and what we argued before the high court at that stage was that how can point of taxation be fixed for something which is not taxable in other words if we say that the development right is nothing but akin to sale of land and build uh, akin to sale of land and sale of land and building is specifically excluded from the purview of gst how could there uh, be a tax on something which is akin to sale of land and hence should not be taxable fortunately there are some uh, amendments which have come later with respect to the development right uh, now the reverse charge mechanism is applicable the liability is on to the developer the liability is also restricted proportional only with respect to the unsold inventory while this is a welcome uh, amendment after our repetition the moot point still remains that whether on the first principle it is taxable the second uh, point still which also remains is that whether there can be a correlation between the unsold inventory and the sold inventory and the proportional tax payment when something is akin to sale of land so that debate will continue and we'll see that how the courts would address that issue in the days to come there was an interesting another interesting petition which was filed for the real estate player with refer, with reference to the differential tax rate and it was one of the very very difficult petitions to argue before the delhi high court because anything where you're challenging which is based on the differential tax rate which is nothing but the tax policy or the fiscal policy will be very very difficult to justify in the court because uh, the court will always say that these are subject to judicial review and so on and so forth and whether they are not uh, remains the question mark but i think that rate differential uh, was more from the logic perspective was more from the inverted duty structure perspective was more from the perspective that it probably got missed out and there are differential rates for a subcontractor and a contractor and fortunately after fine after uh, the first hearing when the notices were issued the matter got addressed the gst council proactively made that amendment to uh, remove that anomaly next i would move on to the license fees uh, which are paid by casinos alcoholic liquor license mining rights etc and so on and so forth uh, there has been a circular which has been issued with respect to taxing some of these uh, license fees the question which remains uh, as a and a debate is whether tax can be imposed on the sovereign function of the government one second is there a quid pro quo with respect to these transactions whether there is an element of actual service which is being given by the government by giving those license fees and so on and so forth so that remains again uh, the point which has to be decided by the court uh, moving next is with respect to the rbi circular which we had challenged in the delhi high court and which ultimately went to the supreme court and that is with respect to the cryptocurrencies we know now that the supreme court has decided in favor of the cryptocurrencies uh, uh, sector and the exchanges and these cryptocurrencies will now uh be allowed to be traded and the restriction which was there uh imposed by the banks will no longer be there our petition was not only with respect to uh the banking restrictions 
but more also with respect to the gst applicability on these cryptocurrencies whether the, the valuation would be based on the margins or whether the valuation would be based on the actual consideration for the supply of each of these bitcoins and so on and so forth tax cascading for publishers uh, the writ petition was filed long time back uh, with respect to three issues uh, one of the issue uh, was with respect to the authors which were there under the reverse charge uh, it was a big cost for the publishers thereafter the amendment came as an option which was given to the authors to pay tax under the forward charge so most of the authors which would fall within the threshold got that benefit subsequent are subsequent to our writ petition the other writ petition which was filed was very interesting with respect to the procurement from unregistered dealer and applicability of reverse charge mechanism on those uh, transactions wherein the procurement happens from unregistered dealer subsequent to the writ petitions and several hearings the gst council understood the problem which would be faced by lot of businesses who would either stop procuring from the unregistered dealer or would fall into the compliance problem loop and thereafter subsequent to our writ petition this issue was uh, appropriately addressed by the gst council by making appropriate amendments to section 94 and 54 igst uh, with respect to the transactions between the branches uh, indian branch and the foreign uh, branches head office and so on and so forth when one of them is, is uh, located in india and the other one was located outside india was a big issue which came uh, in the initial phase with respect to the gst uh, rates and the issue which was there was whether tax can be levied in a situation wherein the indian branch render services to its head office while we understood that and highlighted to the court that as one of the conditions in the export rules it is appropriate not to give that export benefit to these transactions but at the same time it is not at all appropriate to tax these transactions because the place of provision should be based on the destination and the destination is determined by the location of the service recipient and hence in those cases we challenge the applicability of the levy of the igst per se fortunately subsequent to our writs the banking sector and all of the license offices etc etc got a huge relief and uh, the subsequent amendment came by which this benefit of exemption was given to these uh, transactions the point still remains that with respect to that intervening period can the refund be filed now uh, which uh, i think is legitimate enough uh, to be received back another issue is, uh, which is very relevant is with respect to the forced recovery of gst with respect to the insolvency provisions uh, the system did not pro uh, when all of these insolvency proceedings happen and irp is appointed there is a period which is an intervening period from the time uh, the insolvency proceedings are heard until the time the irp is appointed now what happens is once the irp is appointed it is his responsibility to pay taxes for the future period but the gst system did not allow in various cases uh, to file it either manually or proceed with the tax payment for the future without clearing the past liabilities ideally the if we see the provision the moratorium kicks in and all of the past liabilities will have to be claimed only by operational creditors or financial creditors by filing the due claims but because of the system problem there were issues and hence we approached gujarat high court to take assistance from the court that these uh, benefit of refund should be given for those cases where the tax has been paid fortunately uh, subsequent to our writ petition there have been uh, amendments which now uh requires that the irp's entity would be treated as a distinct entity and hence this uh, problem of the system with respect to the payment of the erstwhile taxes till the time the irp is appointed has been uh, addressed to a very very large extent transitional credit with uh, respect to different cesses uh education ses krishi kalyan ses secondary and higher education ses has also been challenged by us and there has been a retrospective amendment by which the credit has been denied and we have challenged that retrospective amendment and we have challenged that this remains a vested right and in fact yesterday's decision of the delhi high court in some way or the other will also help in our arguments further with respect to these taxes 
another issue with respect to these uh, taxes and the related issue was with respect to the social welfare surcharge the social welfare surcharge exemption was argued by us in gujarat high court on the basis that when some import when when there is an exemption with respect to imports when these scis and meis licenses are used exemption means that the tax is zero now if you multiply something by zero uh, our uh, understanding should be very clear that anything which is multiplied by zero would remain zero and based on that arithmetic based on that logic it would be very very feasible to extend that benefit of that exemption even to the social welfare surcharge on those import transactions where scis and meis benefits have been availed uh, by the importers another uh, interesting issue which we took uh, before the delhi high court was with respect to the taxability of uh, rec scripts for the power sector uh, these rec scripts are these tradable scripts the question is whether this is akin to power per se which is exam the second question which also remains is whether these are securities transactions in securities etc are uh, exempt from tax payment the way the shares are traded on bombay stock exchange and other exchanges even these scripts are traded on the exchanges and hence from that perspective whether they would fall within the definition of securities and if that is the case then this circular which imposes a tax on sale of these rec scripts uh, would would have to be turned down so that there is no tax applicability on these rcs for the power sector physical export of epcg licenses uh, there have been changes in the foreign trade policy with respect to uh, uh, with respect to the transactions once the transition has happened into the gst regime and what has happened in this case is that the condition with respect to the physical export has changed in few cases and now if i was issued an epcg license based on uh, the parameter that the service which i am doing or the activity which i am doing would be considered towards meeting the export obligation whether moving into the gst regime would change that fundamental basis based on which i had received the epcg license and we argued it before the court that such a substantive condition which is changed uh, later makes life difficult and it is a legitimate expectation of the taxpayer that those same conditions would continue which were relevant at the time of the issuance of these epcg licenses there have been few cases uh, where the recovery of uh, taxes have been uh, made from the shareholder uh, we have challenged these provisions because we are very very clear that a shareholder is different from the promoters and from the company per se and hence any recovery of taxes which is being made or intended to be made from the shareholder is completely completely wrong uh, another issue which has which was subsequently addressed uh, and resolved by the gst council was with respect to the double taxation on imported goods stored in customs bonded warehouse on the inbound and the outbound trans transfer of these goods there was a tax imposed and which defeated the purpose uh, there was a circular and so on and so forth but at a later stage this has been addressed after filing of our writ petition similarly there were a lot of exemptions which were granted for the domestic procurements for r&d centers in india there were specific cases where they could in the erstwhile regime procure goods and services at a lesser rate or at an exempted rate and hence there was not only working capital issue but also other benefits which were given by way of exemptions to these r&d centers but once the transition happened into the gst regime this benefit was denied uh, and all of these procurements became taxable the question which there after arose was this specific time which was prescribed for these exemptions will that continue uh, for the later period when the license which has been issued to the r&d center continues with a stipulated time coming on to my last two uh, ones is one is with respect to the non availability of itc or non fulfillment of export obligation and there is a clear restriction 
in law today under the GST that if you do not fulfill the export obligation, you would end up paying the tax, which is non-creditable. We have very, very strongly taken it to the court by saying that this tax payment, which is being made by me for non-fulfillment of export obligation should be made available to me as credit because that was always a credit which was also available, made available to me in the erstwhile regime. So for these existing licenses which were issued to me in the past, there should be the same treatment with respect to the tax, uh, tax payment. Uh, another issue which came uh, before courts was with respect to these statutory C forms, etc., which were issued in the erstwhile regime. Uh, for which there was a lot of resistance by the tax authorities to issue this uh, for petroleum, petroleum products and uh, related sectors, which caused huge hardship uh, in the GST regime, which was ultimately settled after our argument uh, before the Punjab and Haryana High Court. Last but not the least is with respect to the target plus schemes, which were there uh, before the GST came into play. Uh, this benefit had to flow for these schemes based on certain targets which is to be made, basis the target which is to be made, it is very, very clear that the benefit has to flow even in the current regime based on a promise which was made earlier. While it is true that the principle of promise to estoppel may not be true, may not be relevant in a lot of fiscal uh, situations, fiscal matters, but yes, I think larger public interest, the intention of that benefit will all have to come into play. So before I open it for the Q&A session, uh, how I would want to summarize it for all of my uh, lawyer friends, all my other clients and other uh, people, other friends who are there, is to go by logic. Most of the red petitions which I have argued, I have used more of logic and less of law. Law will in any case come into play. But till the time you feel your heart says that there is logic to the problem, uh, it looks arbitrary and conviction within yourself, you will always emerge and be able to justify. In the same way, the way it happened uh, in the recent ruling, which has been pronounced yesterday by the Delhi High Court, Delhi High Court understood the logic, understood the intention, understood that it's a vested right, understood that the period of limitation as per the Limitation Act should be made applicable and gave a wide benefit to people all across uh, different sectors throughout the country. So from that perspective, I think uh, it is more important for us to think logically. And in any case, we all are legal experts that those principles, legal provisions will come into play. But I think most of these petitions are uh, used more, are one more from the logic and not only from the legal provisions. With that, I will take a pause and I would ask, uh, you know, uh, to open it for the Q&A session. So thank you very much, Abhishek, sir. Uh, I've, been, I've been getting a lot of questions from the beginning of the session. So I think now I'll open the platform uh, for, for our participants to ask you the questions. So, Special. dear participants, uh, you can raise your hands in the app and then, or you can just, uh, if, if you've already sent me your queries earlier, I request you to send them again because, uh, you know, I, I lose the track of all the questions that you've already sent. So, I, I'll first go with the people who have raised their hands. Uh, sir, with your permission, I'll start, sir. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, first question, uh, Mr. Nishit Jain. Yes, sir. Good evening. You. you can ask your question. Yes, good evening, sir. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing your insights. You know, we young lawyers always look forward to learn from practical experience of our seniors. And many congratulations uh, for this landmark decision of uh, Delhi High Court, which is already talk of the town. Sir, my uh, question is with respect to this decision only. Now, what Article 300A provides is that no person would be deprived of the property unless such act is provided by law. Now, input tax credit is also a statute provided law, uh, provided right, and not a common law right. And therefore, the statute can take it. So, Finance Act 2020 proposed an amendment in uh, uh, Section 141, 
and thereby inserted the words within such time. The amendment though has not been notified yet. So one of the arguments which was placed by the petitioners was that the uh, the uh, substantive right has been taken by a subordinate legislature by way of Rule One One Seven. So this uh, uh, argument seems to have been plugged by the government. So in this view, uh, in view of this, can it be said that Delhi High Court decision is a good law? Delhi High Court decision, I think, first you have uh, examined it very closely, and I would really appreciate uh, this that you have understood this aspect very, very well. Uh, that point when this matter was argued, if you see the date of the argument and even the date of the pronouncement, that proposed amendment was always there. The only question which today is that the only question which today is is that whether this becomes applicable retrospectively. So first we need to see whether it is applicable as on the date the decision is passed. It is. It has not been enacted. That is one. Second, assuming that it would have been enacted or is enacted when the matter is heard before the Supreme Court, all of these grounds which have formed the basis for the Delhi High Court to pass the decision are all relevant ground will be argued even at the apex court. But what will in addition be argued before the apex court is the retrospective amendment of this because it gives a retrospective effect to it. Now, if the amendment comes today and the amendment, if it's something with respect to what should have happened on 1st of July 2007 or within 90 days or within three days, three years, or within that time when I would have taken this credit, it is basically impacting in a retrospective way. Now the additional challenge which will come, and you are right, is that if this proposed amendment comes becomes a law and is enacted, the only additional challenge which will be there is to challenge the retrospective applicability of that as well. But having said that, I think the decision of the Delhi High Court is a, it's a speaking order. It's a brilliant order. It's a very logical order. It's a very pragmatic order. If you see all of these gr uh, grounds on the basis of which it has been concluded, it very clearly says that it's a vested right. 300 capital of the constitution comes into play. Subordinate legislation. In fact, there were Supreme Court decisions which were argued at length to decide and determine that what is directory, what is mandatory, the three conditions which make a provision mandatory were argued at length before uh, the High Court. There is a decision of Justice Nariman uh, where he has held that basis these three conditions only it will be mandatory. And hence, I think the view which has been taken by the Delhi High Court is very, very pragmatic that these civil rights have to be looked into from the time perspective as per the period of uh, as per the limitation act which in this case should be 3 years and uh, last but not the least is how would you define technical difficulty which should be uh, very broad there cannot be two different yardsticks to de uh, de uh, define those so i think basis that delhi high court decision is very practical pragmatic and i think the only uh, point which you have highlighted there will make our life a little uh, tough, I would not say extremely tough, a little tough because uh, thereafter the argument will also have to address the retrospective applicability due to this amendment. Hope I answered you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, so, dear participants, I request you if suppose your, your if your queries is answered in any of, any of the queries, I request you not to repeat the same queries because we need to take up uh, more, more different queries. I can see a lot of uh, hands raised, so, so I hope you understand the paucity of time as well. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm going to unmute Aparna, ma'am. Yeah. Aparna, ma'am, you can ask your question. Uh, Mr. Rastogi. Yeah. Hi. Aparna Nanda Kumar. Hi. This is Aparna Nanda Kumar uh, from yes. Rast Airport. I'm the senior standing counsel for the GST and Customs. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, and it was a wonderful presentation. Thank uh, you so much, ma'am. 
congratulations for your victory uh, during this uh, covid period you've got a wonderful order fantastic uh, two things i just wanted to mention you were talking about social welfare surcharge uh, see the madras high court has actually dealt with this i think you know about it uh, mr uh, sujit ghosh and uh, argued and mr aditya reddy who's your friend also good friend very good friend yes uh it's mutual actually <laughs> so uh, yes uh, so uh, the petitions have been dismissed of course the gujarat high court uh, definitely will may take a different view but that is one thing and secondly on the education says matter see what has happened against the show cause notice that was issued uh the repetition to reverse the you know the itc the petition was filed by sutherland and the single judge of the madras high court had allowed the repetition and uh, against that uh, the revenue filed the i filed the petition uh, writ appeal for the revenue and we've got a stay so that is there and uh, apart from that as you said the retrospectivity has also been challenged before the madras high court notice has been ordered and mr ap shrinivas is appearing for the revenue in that matter so just i just wanted to supplement these things uh, yes ma'am ma'am actually aparna ma'am this is very interesting yeah. i think i mean I, and i can share that that sometimes we learn a lot from each other we yeah. learn we have argued so many matters yeah, and sometimes yeah, yeah. what happens that we argue and sometimes it has happened that yeah. our opponents become judges <laughs> that has happened <laughs> also <laughs> so yeah. ma'am but giving full respect uh, to uh, our judicial system i yeah. think we all are part of it uh, it is our duty to respect uh, the decisions which are there yeah. uh, of course uh, we have seen contradictory decisions and if you yeah. see especially the transitional credit uh, one year period on the yeah. stocks both the decisions um, bombay high court decision negative decision I, beautiful yeah. decision it's worth I, reading uh, yeah. similarly gujarat high court decision is yeah. worth reading yes, Now, yes. both of absolutely. these decisions are absolutely, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. opposite to each other but absolutely. both of these decisions are beautiful beautifully are, uh, beautifully uh, uh, drafted decisions yes yes, yes. absolutely uh, absolutely so with respect to the social welfare surcharge ma'am uh, while yes there is uh, there is of course uh, there is of course a decision from your court with respect to the social welfare surcharge i think the bigger hardship is for the aftermath of this decision and the circular <laughs> which has been issued i yeah. think that is adding insult to injury and <laughs> that, <laughs> that is adding insult to injury uh, on a lighter note i am mentioning that but i think my petition is also challenging that circular right yes 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 i remember so i still the, i, I the remember time, seeing that yes, yes. ma'am till the time there is an argument with respect to the exemption with respect to social welfare surcharge i think we have to respect the decisions of different courts yes yes it gets proceeded and i think your court has again passed a good decision i yeah. would not all these decisions whether positive or negative uh, improves our learning process a thought process. and so on and absolutely, so forth but absolutely. i think what was very discouraging for the indian exporter in this uh, time when all indian exporters are facing tough time is that circular which has been issued thereafter yeah based on unicorn yes yeah which basically says that you can't even uh, you know uh, pay that from the credit so yeah. so that i think has created lot of trauma and uh, my petition uh, covers that aspect as well yes yes in I fact know, yeah in fact the madras high court judgment has actually asked us to you know uh, reverse the uh, itc so that uh, that would be easier for him. that was the that was the i mean re reverse the itc of uh, his itc what absolutely. so but then uh, not the payment of cash that was not the direction of the madras high court. absolutely absolutely that was not the direction of the and yeah. they have gone significant steps ahead without realizing that all of these meis seis etc all of these benefits are there in public interest yeah, yeah. and by doing this you are basically hurting the domestic industry so from that perspective my logic will be very very clear to argue it before the court that this circular is more killing than anything else i wish you best of luck thank Definitely. you ma'am thank yeah. you ma'am thank you very much thank you thank you ma'am nice to connect with you yeah thank you sir so uh, with your permission sir we can take up a few more questions sir depending yeah, yeah, on yeah we have we have time we have 17 minutes left and all, all right in between sir. also we had dropped in uh, yes, even sir. if some people want to log out that's absolutely okay but we will address some few more questions sure sir thank you sir uh, so next question uh, i'm going to unmute mr avinash kedia mr avinash sir, you can ask a question 
Yeah, yeah. Sir, I just want to. I I was listening to that. You told me in the section one thirty five, one thirty two B. What is the purpose of this arrest? But nowadays, in they have been arresting the employees and all, and they are creating lot of problem that that employees had made a defraudation of one hundred crore, fifty crores. But this is a circular trading, and they are arresting and they are not giving the bail. Sir, any other case law or any other order has been passed with any other court, they will get the bail, and a, a bail has been given. Sir, I have argued these matters in Bombay High Court, where we have got favourable orders in more more than couple of these cases. Hmm. Only difficulty which today is is that the Supreme Court has passed the order, which which basically says that there is there is no point for Supreme Court to interfere as of now, and. that order of high supreme court also basically says that that order of supreme court should be considered while giving benefit in all of the future uh, cases so as of now as we speak is are a little reluctant that is one secondly i think what we will have to see is whether the best way to approach the court is to file an anticipatory bail in those cases or get a bail after the arrest or basically filing a writ petition which is actually not anticipatory bail but questioning the provisions in such a way that the coercive measure is not taken against the against the taxpayer especially on in those cases where either they do not cross the threshold of 5 crores leakage or there is no leakage for sure so i think it will be very very fact specific but yes there there are some decisions of bombay high court which you should read and which will help you okay sir thank you thank you sir we can go to the next question uh sir i'll read out a, a, a question from ms kirti from bombay bar uh, her audio is not clear so she is not able to unmute herself and come okay i'll just read out her yeah uh so she says uh, sir congratulations on your victory on the issue of trans uh, transitional credit i have query on the said issue in yeah. respect of transitional credit various high courts have taken different or contrary view uh, for example bombay high court and delhi high court further delhi high court considers it as vested right and bombay high court has held otherwise in this backdrop i wish to ask whether contrary decisions of different high courts can be considered as infringement of fundamental right under article 14 the ssc in delhi can transit can transit credit till 30th of june 2020 however ssc in maharashtra would not be able to do so can slp be filed in supreme court to to contest nelco decision on this ground and press urgency as time limit of 3 years will expire on 30th of june 2020 thanks so i'll answer the last one of course slp should be filed by nelco uh, that goes without saying uh, because that's very relevant uh, kirti that is one secondly see i had uh, explained that uh, initially also in my initial part of the presentation that this entire set now gets divided into three portion one the the tax payers or the petitioners who are there in delhi they will clearly get the benefit those petitioners who will be outside the state of maharashtra second then the petitioner himself in maharashtra who has got a negative order who will have no option but to file an slp uh, argue urgency then what happens to those other tax payers who are within the state of maharashtra and the jurisdictional tax office may use nelco rather than this brand equity decision i think uh, in those cases it is very important to read the line of the delhi high court decision which basically says that the respondent will publicize this decision which means that they will have to publicize this decision and one of the respondents is also union of india when it comes to union of india it is not the responsibility of union of india to extend that benefit only to the tax payers situated in the state of delhi or other states apart from maharashtra but it will be the responsibility casted on the respondent in this case union of india also to get that uh, benefit so basically what happens in a sense now is that 
this will have wide implications it will not be an easy journey but yes uh, this will give some sigh of relief to those petitioners who are in delhi who are outside the state of maharashtra and even the state of maharashtra because the respondent is supposed to do that uh, give that extend that benefit they should give that benefit the only thing is that now whether the respondents can get stay till 30th of june and i think if they are not able to get that stay till 30th of june they will be bound to give that benefit in the intervening period till the time that get stay on that so from that perspective yes uh, nelco should immediately move uh, to uh, the supreme court and should use this decision while all others can take the benefit of this decision till the time there is any sort of uh, reluctance to extend that benefit from the tax authorities thank you very much sir yeah i think i hope uh, ms kirti would have uh, got her uh, answer so i have uh, mr sanjay kakkar who is the commissioner of gst he has a question to ask i will just unmute him uh, sanjay sir uh, good evening i don't know whether the audio is okay for my system but so it is coming very clearly sir you can ask your question nice of you and uh, my question pertains to intermediary services which has always been a disputed territory in gst and uh, mr rasogi was talking about the Uh, the destination aspect of the gst services now we have a lot of uh, assessees in our i am from the karnataka zone we have a lot of assessees who are having this dispute my query is when the act the section 138 b of igst act specifically says that in case of intermediary services this shall be the location of the supplier of services how are we taking it legally sir uh, that is the entire dispute what we are saying is that while section 138b very very clearly provides that the place of provision would be the place where the service provider is there and hence it becomes taxable in india we are challenging place of provision per se okay and what we are saying is that in this case not falling within the default rule which means that an exception has been carved for an intermediary and the destination of the service recipient or the location of the service recipient is not relevant because you have casted an exception for me now why this is arbitrary or unconstitutional apart from the other grounds i will tell you the main ground is that when the service recipient is located outside of india the benefit is received by the service recipient outside of india it could be by way of report etc etc or the consumption actual benefit has happened or is being received how is this service different from other services let's say such as management consultant services let's say an investment advisory service portfolio manager in all of those cases for instance and i use this example in the court in gujarat high court i use this example for instance the portfolio manager is sitting in india the customer or the recipient of those investment services is based in new york and based on my advice he buys share either on bombay stock exchange or london stock exchange or any other stock exchange across the world so based on my service he is investing in different parts of the world similar case of intermediaries the service is only to the person who is located outside of india there is no doubt about it the privity of contract with respect to the service provider and the service recipient is very very clear the service recipient is outside of india and i have a privity of contract with him now when the benefit of that service is received by him by a person who is situated outside of india how can tax be levied by creating an exception to an intermediary services compared to all other services wherein the the default rule kicks in so that has to be answered in light of these provisions apart from these other uh, other aspects and ground which have been argued i would not at this stage want to uh, give more details on this issue because the matter is subject this order has been reserved uh, hearing has been concluded but one thing i can uh, absolutely in very very clear words tell you whatever that decision is it will be a very very interesting landmark decision whether positive or negative because unimaginable level of uh, arguments have gone into this various um, 
questions with respect to the constitution aspects have gone into this writ petition uh, which i would not want to disclose as of now but let's see how the order comes but the basis or the primary basis remains that only that how uh, arbitrary will these services be and why an exception has been created for these services also what is there in public domain is with respect to lot of these circulars rajya sabha select committee report and so on and so forth wherein everybody is concluding that the benefit should be given to the indian intermediaries and happens if i just open an office in bangladesh i open an office in nepal but uh, bhutan i can open a small office and do all the billing from there those people will get all the benefit i will shift my business there i will pay even my direct taxes there and the country at large will lose so in larger public interest uh, is it not important to see whether the benefit should be extended to the indian intermediaries so it probably going only on the larger public interest aspect i think the aspect of reasonable classification is also being considered sir reasonable classification a... and even the constitutionality will come into play uh, 286 and all has been argued at length uh, and let's see how it how it is being decided nice of you thank you very much thank you sir thank you thank you sir uh, so uh, we'll take up a question from mr uh, yogesh sethia mr yogesh mr yogesh you can hear me yes 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 sir so my query is related to itc of gst paid under rcm uh, my query is sir uh, if we see rule 36 uh, uh, it it if one one of the condition is that in case of uh, itc for the gst or rcm you need to do self invoicing and apart from the uh, payment of the tax is one of the essential condition to take that itc so if i once i make the payment of such gst then only i am eligible to take that credit. so my question is whether the time limit prescribed under section 16 sub section 4 is applicable in that situation so basically the law is very clear that uh, you take the benefit of credit after the payment and the point of taxation with respect to this payment comes into play for rcm there is a there is a point of taxation which provides that when will be the point of taxation which is to determine the the date on which the liability has to be discharged you discharge the liability as per the point of taxation and take the uh, claim of credit so but in case i have i have paid the Uh, gst liability for say for financial year 18 19 in march 2020 so in whether in march 2020 can i take the credit so so first question is that as per the provisions of the point of taxation have yes, you sir. paid on time sir i have not paid on time but not i have paid, paid along with so, due interest sir right due interest right. liability so, i have paid so let's go step by step yes sir yes as per the provisions of the point of taxation whether you have paid it on time the answer is no. no yes sir second question is whether you have complied everything in the system the answer is yes because you have paid the tax and have paid yes, sir the other point is that what is the time restriction for availing the credits have you availed the credit within the time restriction yes sir time restriction in this credit. case is in this case is from the date of payment yes 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 okay. so you can take okay okay so if we if we think uh, methodoc methodoc uh, step by step then i think life becomes easier for the way this is a little tricky yeah 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 but yes, it's such a way that it is a little tricky but if you answer yes or no you will get the yes. answer okay 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 thank you sir thank you no problem yogesh thank you sir so uh, i think we have 5 minutes left uh, we can just take up two more questions sir yeah thank you sir Uh, i'm sorry but i know that there are so many questions but i'll be uh, in a position only to take up two more questions due to paucity of time uh, so uh, next question uh, i will i will ask on behalf of miss uh, i think i miss uh, krita loda from mumbai so her question is if assessee miss to avail senvat credit in his ER one or ST three returns, it cannot be taken in TRAN one since it is not closing balance of carried forward credit. Can it be taken in GSTR three B? 
no so first point is that whether this can be taken in light of this delhi high court decision it can be taken now the delhi high court decision also very clearly says that it can be taken either manually or otherwise so either they will have to open the portal or they should allow it manually so we should immediately write to them to open the portal if they open the portal nothing like it if they don't open the portal then file it manually if they don't act on that then of course they are not following all what has been provided in the delhi high court thank you sir uh sir uh, with your permission uh, there's request for two more questions sir yeah i'll, I'll just take last two questions thank you sir uh, so i'm just going to unmute uh, natarajan sir yeah natarajan sir good evening you can ask your question sir i think so one minute uh, natarajan yeah. sir can you hear me yeah. yeah 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 you are able to hear me yes sir you can ask your question yeah very good evening mr rasaki this is again on the intermediary so right, we are eagerly waiting for a positive outcome from that particular case sir i, I am waiting one, as well <laughs> yeah what do you know i have uh, how this problem if at all it is encountered how you are trying to overcome i am not able to uh, one of the uh, what i thought why the government has placed uh, uh, under 138 b this is a service providers location suppose that the assistant i am a commission agent for a foreign person he wants to sell his machinery in india i am acting as a commission agent i am getting orders for him and he is paying me 10% commission so one crore worth of machinery is imported into india because of my efforts and i get 10 lakhs as a foreign exchange commission if the recipient place is a place of supply i will get the benefit of export of service but why this benefit has not been given according to me is because of the service provided by me to that foreign person one crore of foreign exchange is going out of india no doubt i am earning 10, 10 lakhs in foreign exchange no doubt but because of my efforts because of whatever i have done one crore worth of foreign exchange is going out of india which the government did not want want to promote so that could have been in fact under service tax before 1009 2004 the position was like that only it was based on the recipient location only with the from 2014 the law was amended and they made it as a person uh, service provider's location if, if you take it otherwise suppose i am an indian person i want to export i appoint a local person as my agent commission agent they are also gs will be payable but no problem the exporter will take credit and he will claim refund no problem but only in case of import because of my efforts more foreign exchange is moving out of the country if at all this is an issue how we can overcome it so sir you have a point but uh, suppose let's say i am based out of delhi or let's say i am based out of chennai and i open a small office in colombo and do all billing from colombo then i am not paying any gst i am not paying any tax and the import comes into india in any case now what we are arguing is that the place of provision of this service should not be and sir i think this notification which has come at a subsequent stage which creates a distinction when the goods move to india and when the goods move to some other place outside of india has actually benefited me because it makes it more arbitrary to say that the place of provision for the same service provider rendered to the same service recipient becomes taxable in two different ways based on the movement of goods whether these goods are coming in india or going outside of india so i think that has made my life easier so if this notification would not have been there to give partial benefit when the goods are moving out of india i would have to restrict myself completely to uh, the constitution 286 and so on and so forth 246 and uh, so on and so forth but now with this it makes it more arbitrary but let's see sir how it comes uh, it comes i think it will it will be uh, a very very speaking order uh, worthwhile to read each and every line of this uh, i have myself done lot of research on this uh, every hearing and this matter was uh, heard over a period of 
partial hearings uh, 10 days or something so you could imagine the amount of details which would have gone into this uh, petition thank you very much sir so the final question uh, joseph sir wants to ask i'll just unmute him joseph sir <laughs> it's it's been a great uh, uh, abhishek uh, congratulations are wonderful thank you sir absolutely wonderful uh, i think uh, i don't think uh, you have left any topic open in any court <laughs> sir i have filed more topics. than i have filed sir more than 100 petitions and when i was talking to you and to aditya <laughs> it was becoming very difficult for me to summarize everything but no, 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 absolutely absolutely into three uh, dozen petitions three dozen issues yeah but yes i have basically argued on all diverse sectors diverse issues, and all issues basically which are there i have argued yeah yeah no nothing no no issues left open i have only one question i want don't, don't want to detain you see right, what, sir madra sai court uh, any of the writs which have you been filing for the last about 3 years now 2017 18 19 20 now anything on gst we have the habit of impleading the gst council new delhi we find, we know the or whatever address in new delhi we say the third respondent fourth respondent in addition to the jurisdictional ac who are right in, sir my learned friends from the ba i mean the the department council uh, aparna hemlata hemamurli shaladam maria sundarakrishnan and all srinivas is there you know they come and say that you know council will take a decision then uh, after some time they come and say the council uh, you know it, it's kind of uh, you know the the council is kind of intangible now what is your uh, practice in other courts and what is the role of council as an respondent in a writ petition on gst do they ever represent or come through a council and then make their probably i mean submissions or file counter what is the practice in other courts sir the point is that 279 do, do i'm sorry i'll i one more point I'll, should we should we implead gst council at all in the first place right sir yeah shall i yes yes please sir uh, it is all, <laughs> the more the merrier but that's not what the logic is sir the logic is that uh, we have seen in various courts that the courts are these days uh, not very willing to decide on the constitutionality of it some courts are very and that's a fact that some courts give the benefit but still would not want to held that a provision is unconstitutional so in those cases the court also feels that the benefit should go without deciding on the constitutionality by way of formation of some high level committees or recommendation and so on and so forth and we have seen that in different courts so from that perspective if this message goes to the gst council that you need to decide that it becomes easier for the court also and for the petitioner also because ultimately then the gst council will have to respond that why this is to be done whether this can can be done or cannot be done that is one so that is on the more on the practical side sir but on the legal side why these gst councils are made as respondent is because of section 279 capital a of the indian constitution which provides that the gst council shall provide recommendation for the following issues and so on and so forth and that's there in front of me clause 4 says gst council shall make recommendation to the union and the states on and a to h those different issues are there now in most of these cases they may fall within that in most of the cases it has also happened that the notifications or the subsequent amendments which have happened they are not based on the recommendation of the gst council it has happened that an amendment has been moved or a circular has come which is which should have actually happened on the recommendation of the gst council because the constitution provides that but and i have myself asked in courts that the recommendation of the gst council for sh this should be placed on record and if there is no recommendation of the gst council who has taken this view absolutely if they have and if there is a recommendation of that that should be part of the minutes of the gst council that should be there should be a clear uh, 
way forward or the clear uh, recommendation provided by them now in those cases it becomes very very appropriate and relevant for us to make gst council also a part of it so that they can guide the court put their proper submissions before the court whether they have provided this recommendation whether they have not provided this recommendation whether they will take some action because sir ultimately it's the council is a good structure actually with the center and all of these states and if something comes from the council it becomes easier uh, for implementation so from that perspective uh, it is important to keep gst council as one of the respondents so when in doubt i think it is better to include them right but yes in few cases we should not include them also because the court can ask this specific question which you have asked that the role of gst council in this why you have uh, you know included gst council few courts are very very particular to see that what respondents are especially if you see rajasthan and all they are very very particular you can't just uh, have anyone and everyone as a respondent so i think we have to be mindful of that also we can't just put everyone as respondent but in few cases it becomes very relevant at the time you are able to justify uh, joseph sir that uh, there is a need to include them i think it is justified and can be tackled in court right thank you thank you abhishek thank you so much sir yeah. thank you very much abhishek sir thank uh, you, sir sir we know we all know that you have done you have dealt with enormous number of issues pertaining to gst and there are questions cropping up even till now but then uh, i we have already crossed our time so we uh, i'm really sorry to all the participants for not taking up a question i think i we must request abhishek sir to have a one a special session only for question and answer <laughs> if time pleasure permit. will be all mine and i think <laughs> i would much, uh, before we end i think i would want to again thank aditya uh, joseph sir uh, my colleagues uh, in khetan you know who also initiated this discussion with you who helped me in this uh, uh, you know preparation for this and i think uh, it was a good learning for us also to answer some of these interesting questions and last but not the least uh, i wish everybody good health and safety uh, and be with uh, sa be safe with family and friends thank you very much sir for your words uh, and to all the participants as i have already put before in the chat box you if you have missed the session by any chance due to some network issues or whatever you can always access the session on our youtube channel the link i have already shared if you are not able to access the link uh, our youtube channel's name is madras tax bar chennai so you can uh, subscribe to it we will be uploading the session also very soon so you can always hear the session whenever you want to uh, so thank you once again sir i'll just invite aditya sir just to tell a few words before we end the session uh, aditya sir i want to uh, good evening abhishek uh, nothing i just wanted to thank uh, you on behalf of the madras tax bar for uh, agreeing to speak to us and for uh, giving such a thorough presentation i, I know that uh, you had back to back presentations you had one yesterday at symbiosis university also and uh, in spite of that uh, you have taken so much effort and uh, it was uh, such an interesting presentation for all of us uh, coming and i would also like to add that we had our highest uh, turnout uh, of listeners uh, yes, yes. till in the last one more than one month that we've been doing today we had the highest turnout of listeners so i it also like to thank all the uh, audience the professionals the other lawyers from the other uh, bars who participated thanks a lot uh, abhishek once again thank you so much aditya thank you thanks thank you very much sir and thank, thank you, you to all the participants thank, thank you to all the participants for joining us uh, we will see you soon and uh, have a good night and stay safe stay home till we get through this thank you very thank much you. everyone thanks bye thank you